This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome to the Mississippi Arts Hour. Malcolm White here on this Sunday afternoon. Thank you so much for tuning in to MPB Think Radio and especially for dialing up the Mississippi Arts Hour. Today, my guest is Lawrence Wells. Lawrence began his publishing career at the Yakmatothal Press by editing a photobiography, William Faulkner, The Coalfield Collection by Jack Coalfield. Wells is the author of two historical novels, Rommel and the Rebel and Let the Band Play Dixie. Wells received the 2014 Faulkner Wisdom Award for a narrative nonfiction at the Words and Music Festival. He scripted the Emmy-winning 1994 Mississippi ETV documentary, Return to the River, narrated by Mississippian James Earl Jones. His magazine articles have been widely distributed by the New York Times Syndicate. Larry has a brand new book out entitled In Faulkner's Shadow, which is a memoir. And Larry, welcome to the Arts Hour. Thanks, Malcolm. Glad to be here. Well, I really enjoyed uh, reading your book. There are so many stories about so many people that I have known for so long. It was like reading from the family Bible. <laughs> it, it was so nice uh, to reconnect with some of those stories. Uh, many of the stories and photographs in this volume uh, I was present for. Yep. Uh, and I remember very clearly your description um, uh, of these events uh, and these great stories. But if you would, let's begin uh, by sort of, I don't want to give away the book. We want people to buy the book. But if you could begin sort of uh, with your, uh, how you got connected to Oxford uh, and when you came to Oxford. And I guess that would maybe start with you and Deanie's romance. Okay. Um, I was teaching at Murray State University in 1970 when I decided to come to graduate school at Ole Miss in the English department. And it was the best decision I ever made, but I didn't know it then. It was going to take about three months before I met Dean. Um, we met in uh, Lewis Dollarhide's class. You remember Lewis Dollarhide? Oh, yeah. And... Um, uh, it wasn't too long after that that, that we started a, a study session together and, and got to know each other pretty well. Uh, a year later, we started to date. And um, when we were married um, the, uh, in 1972, I began my induction into the Faulkner family, right? right. And, uh, and that, was, uh, that was like another kind of graduate school. <laughs> Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, uh, Larry was married to Dean Faulkner Wells. That was William Faulkner's only niece. And I guess Deanie grew up in Oxford, right? Like the rest well, of the Faulkner family? Well, she grew up in Clarksdale, Memphis, and Little Rock. But she came to Roanoke to stay with her uncle, William, who was also her guardian, her legal guardian. Um, and she spent just about one semester out of every school year, all the way from junior high until junior year in high school at Roanoke and went to school at the Oxford schools. So she basically grew up in Oxford off and on. Yeah. And so you write about this burden or this shadow that you had to live under uh, as a writer, as a historian as a publisher, uh, being married into the Faulkner family. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, that's the uh, theme of the book, really. And um, the shadow was harder for Dean to deal with than it was for me, because I was only an in-law. But she was expected to live up to the Faulkner literary legacy in Oxford and to carry on that tradition. And that was not easy for her. Uh, she was a very modest person and self-effacing and didn't like to speak in public. So in 1970, 
1954, when Ole Miss had their first Faulkner conference, they invited Dean and her cousin Vicki to speak at Bishop Hall and kick off the Faulkner conference. Well, Dean had a trick to get over her nervousness. If someone asked her a question, uh, ask another person a question, she would interrupt them and start to answer it, and then she would get over her stage fright. So Vicky was, Vicky was asked a question by Evans Harrington, I think was the director, and uh, Dean broke in and began to answer it. And from that moment on, she became the spokesperson for the Faulkner family. And I saw her, that, that new Dean persona born that day. I was very proud of her. Afterwards, she, people circled her like she was a rock star to uh, congratulate her. It was beautiful. And so y'all went into this business venture. Uh, was it after after your marriage? It must have been to, yeah. to purchase the in existing Yachmatothal Press, right? Yeah. What happened was Howard Duval, who was a Faulkner collector and had a Duval's men's shop on the square in Oxford, uh, started Yachnipatopa Press by publishing several, reprinting several of John Faulkner's books. That was William's right. brother. Uh, Men Working, Dollar Cotton, and My Brother Bill. And then he talked to Jack Cofield, the son of Colonel J.R. Cofield, the Ole Miss photographer, and William Faulkner's personal family photographer, to put together a photo album telling the story of William's life and pictures. Uh, Howard came to me and asked me to edit that for him. And a as that process unfolded, Howard's business began to fail. Uh, he had sold Duval's and the new owner uh, went bankrupt and Howard had to buy that back. And he sold us half interest in the press at that time. He needed to raise money. And when we brought out the uh, Copio collection, it was a, a big success. The New York Times named it one of their top gift books of 1978. It was um, very well received. And that kicked off a publishing career for Dean and me. We didn't mean to start out as book publishers. We were teaching at Northwest Community College at the time. And um, I like to say we backed into the publishing business. Now, you, you tell um, a great story about uh, Howard Duvall, Duvall taking you around and sort of giving you his Faulkner tour uh, uh -huh. of, the, of the area and taking you out to the old hunting camp. Uh, That's right. Tell a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Okay. Well, Howard was instrumental in inducting me into the local order of William Faulkner, the good old boys who knew Faulkner's landmarks better than they knew his books. And um, Howard took me to the Iron Bridge that's featured in uh, uh, As I Lay Dying, the Iron Bridge that the Bundren family has to cross, but it's washed out. And they try to cross the creek, the actually it's the Yakna River, um, and are washed away. He took me to the Reavers Road, which is the, the old wagon road uh, from Oxford through College Hill out to Sardis Reservoir. And uh, William Faulkner's uh, uh, novel, The Reavers, was based on a uh, trip that his great-great-great-grandfather, J.W.T. Faulkner, took to Memphis. And he went through uh, the uh, little settlement of farmers and uh, local fishermen and they flooded the, the uh, ditch and got him stuck. Well, J.R. Cofield had pictures of that car being stuck and that's the scene in The Reavers, Faulkner's novel. So I was thrilled that the, all these places Howard took me to that were landmarks in Faulkner's fiction and it opened up for me, it gave me a connection, a personal connection with Faulkner's uh, Yachna Patalpa County. And, and, of course, Faulkner lived in Roanoke, his home in town, but he had this other piece of property, right, where he kept horses and he hunted. Yeah, so Howard took me out to Faulkner's farm, which he bought in 1938 when he made 25000 Hollywood paid 25000 for the rights to the unvanquished to make a movie. 
and that was a big payday for him. And so he bought a farm and started raising corn and mules. He got a jackass and a horse, and he started raising mules. And um, the the farm happened to belong to the the Parks family. And Joe Parks had succeeded his uh, uh, grand great grandfather. No, I'm sorry, his grandfather, J. W. T. Faulkner, as president of First National Bank. Mm. And so, and Faulkner put in a. Uh, corral up there on the top of the hill and he had a farmhouse and he and Dean went hunting with him at that hunting cabin. So uh, in in 1998, I think it was around the year 98, maybe 2000, a Polish film director, Jerzy Kromolowski, had the rights to make the uh, movie As I Lay Dying. And he wanted to film it at the farm. And I told him about the farm and he promised to fix up that house, which by the way is in terrible disrepair. It's uh, it's caving in mm. the, the, far, the, the farmhouse, the old Parks family home. And um, and he was going to restore it and let it be a set for the uh, filming of the movie, but it never happened. But Who anyway, wants- he took me out there. And, and th- th- here's a funny story. Um, there's a vulture that lives in that house. There's a, a buzzard lives inside the house, and every time you come up there, it will come out of the house and fly fly up into a tree. Well, you know, Faulkner said he wanted to come back as a buzzard. He was asked by Gene Stein in an interview for the Paris Review in 1955, uh, do you believe in reincarnation? And he said, no, but if I did, I'd want to come back as a buzzard because they're protected by, protected by law and they can eat anything. <laughs> well, that so, busted perched in the tree, and every time I went out there, it gave me a piercing stare. Hmm. And uh, I felt like I had seen that stare before, and I'll tell you where it was. When Dean and I were trying to decide whether to get married, one night I woke up and I saw Faulkner's face at my window. It was just like a photograph, and there were his dark eyes staring into my soul. And I wasn't uh, afraid or concerned. I didn't know what it meant, but it felt comfortable to be in his that presence, whatever it was. So the next day at school on campus, this was 1971, I said to Dean, I think Pappy paid me a visit last night. And she said, was it at three o'clock? Because at three o'clock, the same moment I saw his face, she woke up smelling his pipe smoke. Wow. Okay. Now we're 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 both experiencing what could be termed a visitation, a, a, a ghostly visitation from William Faulkner. We chose to interpret what happened as that he hadn't come to warn us not to get married, but he had come to give us his blessing. Anyway, I saw that same stare from the buzzard later at Faulkner's farm. Wow. I, I had the visitation, that mano a mano stare, and then later I thought I recognized that same stare. Of course, it was just a buzzer. We're visiting with Lawrence Wells. He has a new book out, a memoir entitled In Faulkner's Shadow, and Larry and Deanie Faulkner Wells, long residents of Oxford, um, owner. And do you still operate Yachtmatothal Press? Oh, there? yeah. Yeah, I have yeah. a website. Yeah, yaknapatalfapress.com. The problem is you have to be able to spell Yaknapatalfa. Yeah. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a real Faulkner's, challenge for anybody. That's Faulkner's curse on the reading public. And, Try to spell Yaknapatalfa. Right. Or even say it. And and he got that from, from an Indian, uh, a Chickasaw name, is that right? Yeah, it was a Chickasaw Indian name for a tribe, the, the Yaknapatalfa Indians. And the Yaknapatalfa word in Chickasaw meant gentle water or people of the gentle water, because the Yachtney River, which was their river, Yachtney Patalpa, was a slow-moving creek. And he saw that on a uh, old watershed uh, bank account when he was working at his grandfather's bank, the First National Bank in Oxford, and there was the word Yachtney Patalpa. So you might say Faulkner struck gold at First National Bank. <laughs> Hi, I'm Malcolm White. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. 
You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. For access to more conversations with creative Mississippians, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcast app. I'm Allison Walker, the lady auto mechanic, host of AutoCorrect. If you're enjoying this podcast, try my podcast, AutoCorrect. We help steer you in the right direction with your car problems. Find me on any podcast platform or at autocorrect.mpbonline.org. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Welcome back to the Mississippi Arts Hour. Malcolm White here. I'm your host today in the studio with Kevin Farrell, who is at MPB. I'm in my basement uh, in uh, Bell Haven. And our special guest today is my old friend Larry Wells, professionally known as Lawrence Wells. And he's got a brand new book out, a memoir entitled In Faulkner's Shadow, and it's published by the University of Mississippi Press. Welcome back, Larry. Thank you. Good to be back. So we were playing a little Bob Dylan there, and in the break you were telling me a story uh, about yeah. that song and about Bob Dylan. You want to share that? Yeah, well... I was there in Tad Smith Coliseum when he played a concert there in the 1970s, and uh, we went with Ron Shapiro. In fact, Ron got us the tickets. Wow. He, somehow, Ron was connected with everybody. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. Ron is a great friend of ours, and he and he's a main one of the main characters in this book, by the way. And I'll tell you a quick story about Ron Shapiro. Ron offered to stage the world premiere of Willie Morris's movie, Good Old Boy, at the Hoka, his theater. Ron had taken over an old cotton warehouse and put in a second run movie theater in there. It was cheap because the movies had already been shown. And he had a cafe, so you could come in, order a sandwich he called Love at First Bite, go on into the uh, theater and uh, his ticket taker and projectionist was Barton Siegel. Barton Siegel was one of our great town characters also. He's still here. And uh, when uh, Alex Haley, oh, I'll tell you the Alex Haley story later. This is about the uh, Good Old Boy premiere. I, Dean and I published Good Old Boy, Willie Morris's stories of growing up in Yazoo City. And we published that in 1980 when Willie was teaching at Ole Miss. And uh, so I gave the, uh, I got a call from a, a movie producer in New York who was from Arkansas. And he had heard of Willie Morris and he wanted to know if we were the publishers of Good Old Boy. And so I sent him a copy and he bought the rights to that in uh, less than a month. And uh, Willie, uh, Willie was thrilled to have his first movie. That was Willie's first movie that was made of his work. And they filmed it in Natchez. Mm -hmm. And we took, we took Willie to the rap party. He met the, the little kid who played, uh, who played Willie Morris. Willie came up, to, the little kid came up to Willie. He was, he was from Hollywood. And he said, are you Willie? And Willie <laughs> said, yeah. And he said, who are you? And the kid said, I'm Willie. <laughs> really, really love that. And to, to stage the, uh, we had two or three hundred people assembled at the Hokie. This was one of the great nights in Oxford. It was 1989. And the, the chancellor at the time was Gerald Turner. And he was there in a tuxedo at Warner Alford. And uh, the, the whole town turned out. And we put Willie, Willie had a tux. And we, we put him in a, a convertible driven by my stepson, John Mallard, Dean's son. And he drove Willie to the Hoka and everybody was waiting for him. And they even had a Klieg light on Willie as he comes down the hill. <laughs> He's sitting in the back of the car smoking a cigarette. And it, you could hear the applause uh, out at the university probably. Everybody went wild. <laughs> and this, to me, was the beginning of the Yachna Padolfa Arts Council and the Oxford Film Festival. They hadn't started yet. They hadn't even been conceived. But the town came together for Willie. 
And we had a great night at the Hulk. And where else should we have had the, the world premiere of Good Old Boy, the movie, except at the Hulk? Yeah, I, I was grateful uh, to have been there that evening and attended that uh, event. Uh, and I was I took a special note when reading your book that you pointed out that that humble event, <clears throat> the humble, was the beginning of the Yakmatatho Arts Council and the Oxford Film Festival, both of which receive operating grants from the Mississippi Arts Commission. And we are happy, happy, happy to be their partner in the good work that they do uh, to this day uh, in Oxford and Lafayette County. Absolutely. It's good stuff. So um, Willie came, was it in 79 or 80? It was 1980. Although he, okay. came in, he came in 1979 to scout Ole Miss and, and meet people and see if he could, could move there, if it was congenial. Right. And so we gave a cocktail party for him. We had a tailgating. Ole Miss was playing Georgia that weekend, football. And uh, we went to Taylor Grocery, uh, took Willie and Senator Thad Cochran, uh, and the artist Bill Dunlap was with us. And when we got in there, they wanted to sign the walls. It was going to be their graffiti, right? So Willie writes on the wall with a magic marker, this is where Taylor, Mississippi is where Gavin Stevens and Temple Drake got off the train to buy some bootleg Whitley wh whiskey. So I'm <laughs> really hard. And then Dad Cochran wrote an inscription and then Dunlap drew a gorgeous mural on the wall of a crop duster in the Delta flying along flat over the cotton fields spraying. It was gorgeous. He covered a complete wall with it. And two weeks later, we went back to eat there, and there was so much graffiti. All the kids joined <laughs> in. We couldn't even find uh, any of it, including the mural. <laughs> but it was a beautiful night, and Willie decided he would, he would come back. The last thing he said to us was, see you New Year's. And that's the day he came in on, on New Year's Day, 1980, with David Ray, his son. And there's great stories about your involvement in the negotiations to get uh, Willie hired as writer in residence. And uh, I encourage everybody to get a copy of uh, Lawrence Wells' book, In Faulkner's Shadow, again, published by the University Press of Mississippi, uh, a, a beautiful collection of, of stories, a memoir uh, of those golden years that I thought, I think of those years from the time the Hoka opened until, uh, until Richard Holworth finished his second term as mayor as 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 the what I call cafe society of Oxford and you've you've captured it so brilliantly uh, in your memoir here in Faulkner's shadow well it deserved capturing you know that was a golden age for Oxford it was the second golden age after Faulkner's life in Oxford right and look and Oxford had to come out of Faulkner's shadow too Faulkner was trapped in Faulkner's shadow what would it do after he died? What was it going to be like without their superstar? And uh, we brought in Willie Morris in 1980, and he was the first writer in residence at Ole Miss, and we helped raise the money for his salary. And the town had wanted to show their affection and respect for William Faulkner, but he wouldn't let them because he was mad at the town for calling him Count No Count. Right. And uh, making fun of his books and not, not uh, encouraging or supporting him in the 1930s. So the town was waiting to shower a writer with the affection that they should have given to Faulkner, but he wouldn't receive it. So Willie didn't know this when he came, but Dean and I did. And we stood there and smiled when we saw people just, they were all over Willie. Willie got the, uh, all the affection that the town had been forced to withhold by Faulkner, and it was uh, not that they wouldn't have given it to Willie anyway, but it, I, I'm pretty sure I'm right about this, that it was because Faulkner refused to accept the town's uh, admiration and love that they gave it all to Willie. And then later, of course, the parade uh, ensued. Barry Hanna came, yeah. uh, Richard Ford came, Right. Donna Tart was birthed from there. Grisham, 
yeah. on and on and on the oh, list yeah. goes. And again, uh, you've captured all of this really well in your in your book here. Now, you mentioned earlier you had an, a an Alex Haley story you were going to share with yeah. me. Yeah, well, this is funny uh, how this happened. Alex Haley was invited to the author of Roots, of course. Alex Haley, the author of the great bestseller Roots, um, was invited to speak at Ole Miss. And Willie was right in residence. And he invited him to uh, a dinner. He got Ron Shapiro to put on a dinner party for him, a banquet at the Hope on the stage. And he invited he invited Dean and me and several other people. And the, he left out Barry Hanna because Barry Hanna had fired a pistol in Willie's face, basically, two shots at his farmhouse that he was renting. Willie went out there to see Barry, and I took him out there. And Barry had this thing about pistols. He carried them all the time. He put them in his back pocket. And he was just playing a joke on Willie. But when he fired it, he said, hot damn a deer. And he fired out the screen door. Two quick shots. I mean, look, when we went into his house, Barry Hanna was playing the drums to a Jimi Hendrix uh, uh, record on the top volume on the stereo, just banging those drums. And... Willie and I waited for him to get through playing so he could come over and speak to us. And as he walks over, he whips out his pistol and shoots out a screen door, two quick shots. I looked around and Willie was already running out the, the front door. He was very fast for a big guy. And uh, he, he would not be around Barry anymore alone, just the two of them ever again. But he forgot to, on, I think on purpose, to invite Barry to meet Alex Haley. So Barry's sitting out there in the audience, and we have a wonderful guy named Masaru Inoue, who was a Japanese Faulkner scholar from the uh, Yokohama University. And he was staying in Oxford, and he and Willie were big pals. So he asked to write a, a, a haiku verse about uh, Alex Haley and his work. And... Uh, so Masaru reads this, and Barry's sitting in the audience getting a little bit impatient because he hadn't been invited, and he, he, he says, suddenly there's this voice, and he says, get this freaking show on the road. <laughs> when, he, when he did that, I knew it was Barry instantly, and I look out there, I can't see through the stage lights very good. We're all sitting around a table waiting to be fed. Jane Rule Burdine was cooking pork chops. And... Uh, and Shapiro was just rubbing his hands with glee because he charged five dollars to people to come see. It was five dollars a ticket <laughs> to see us eat dinner. And so Barry Hanna is, is determined to get up there and meet. And Willie was actually embarrassed that he had not invited Barry, and he introduced them. And Barry came up and was nice, and it, it, you know that worked out. But the whole night was amazing. Eating on the stage, Barry Hanna. Looked like a grim Alfred E. Newman of literature <laughs> there in the audience. And stories like this uh, populate your new book entitled In Faulkner's Shadow. Larry Wells is my guest today. Uh, his memoir is re just out, uh, University Press of Mississippi. Hi, I'm Malcolm White. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. For access to more conversations with creative Mississippians, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcast app. I'm Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law host of In Legal Terms. If you're enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to listen to In Legal Terms, the show about you and your rights. We find interesting legal topics to bring to you and let you know how the law affects you. Find In Legal Terms on any podcasting platform on your smart device or on our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. 
Welcome back to the Mississippi Arts Hour. Malcolm White here on the Sunday afternoon. Thank you for joining us on MPB Think Radio, and certainly thank you for tuning in to the Mississippi Arts Hour. Today, my guest is Larry Wells. Larry is a publisher uh, and a writer uh, who lives and works in Oxford, Mississippi, but originally is from Arkansas, I believe. Larry, is that right? No, I'm from Alabama. I went to the University of Alabama. Ah, sorry, wrong state. Nina and I, the only bad fights we ever had were when Alabama beat Ole Miss. <laughs> You know, Dean was the freshman cheerleader at Ole Miss. I did not know that. Uh huh. Yeah. But I do remember the time y'all came to Jackson, if I'm not mistaken, to be part of the Grand Marshal entourage when uh, the St. Patty's Parade oh, theme yeah. was Irish. I had written that. And I yeah. think you and Dean rode in the bus with Willie and did. Ronzo and Dees and a bunch yeah. of other people. It was great. <laughs> that is I tradition. And I remember great. Deanie being in some sort of disguise with a wig on or something. Uh huh. That was that was terrific. And you know another thing I wanted to ask you about when you were talking about when Willie first came to Ole Miss, and it was the Georgia football game, uh, and y'all had the tailgate. Weren't you and Deanie a part of the old South End Zone crowd that Willie and all yeah. of his gaggle of friends were? Where y'all would sit down there in the South End Zone? We did. Uh, we started that South End Zone later, maybe in the after Billy Brewer was the, the coach in 1983. And we didn't have season tickets that year. And we noticed that the South End Zone was a, an eclectic group. And it was mixed races and people were having a great time. And the, the fans were all uh, uh, unified with their love for the Rebels. So we, we moved down there and slowly, Willie began to attract uh, writers and artists. We took Bill, Bill Eggleston down there one time to sit with us at a game, and the crowd was yelling, defense, defense. And I looked over at Eggleston, and he was looking at the clouds. And I looked up, I said, what are you looking at? And a balloon, a balloonist, was becalmed over the stadium. And nobody, everybody, 100% in the stadium was watching the football game. But only Eggleston, with his great perception, had sensed this presence above us and looked up. And there was a big balloon at about 300 feet altitude just sitting there motionless in the sky over the stadium. Now, anyway, there, there's time. a season ticket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That would, that would have been a great season ticket. That. Wow. So the home that you live in, I assume you still live uh, in the in the home on uh, Lamar Street, right? Yeah, it's Miss Maud's house. Miss Maud. Maud's house. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the home. Well, the house was built in 1931. Uh, Maud, it was Maud's dream house, really. And uh, William was 34 then. Uh, they hired her son, Dean, who has just graduated from Ole Miss, to work on the crew to build a house. He dropped bricks on a fellow worker's head and was fired. <laughs> and uh, uh, the house was Miss Maud's uh, uh, full of her art. I mean, we've got her art all over. And um, she had the novelist Elizabeth Spencer was her boarder here in 1946 when Elizabeth was in graduate school at Ole Miss. Um, but Dean and I basically began to bring in the writers. You know, when Willie was t teaching at Ole Miss, every Saturday of a football game, we would have 10 sports writers in there from every newspaper you can think of. Uh, you, I'm sure you came to many of our parties at football mm -hmm. weekends. Many parties many. Uh, in that house and at many. that kitchen table. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We called it the kitchen cabinet. We would right. convene. <laughs> you, were a, you were an honorary member of our kitchen cabinet. That's right. Yeah. So it was, and, it's a wonderful house. And you're still yeah. there. Yep. And it has a historical marker, one of the Mississippi Department of Archives and History's markers yeah. out front. Yeah, we, we had it uh, registered on the National Historic Register in uh, the 1990s, mid-90s. And uh, 
it, it was the home of, of William's parents, Murray Faulkner and Maud Butler Faulkner. Murray died in 32, right after the house was built. So he didn't get to enjoy it. He died young. All of the Faulkners died in their 60s, you know, every one wow. of them. And uh, it's heart attacks. And uh, the, uh, the house was, Maud lived in the house from 30, to until 1960 and when she died in her sleep the bed the book on her bedside table was lady chatterley's lover <laughs> she was a great wow. reader. she was a great and eclectic reader so maude was faulkner's mother yeah william faulkner's mother okay and that's the home that you still live in to this day yeah now, in the book, which is broken into uh, all of these different segments, uh, there's a prologue and then there's Faulkner family. There are 10 chapters around the Faulkner family. Then yeah. Willie Morris and Ole Miss mm -hmm. uh, is next. And there's like five stories there. And yeah. then Rivals in Residence, which is right. a, a whole lot of stories about Billy, about uh, Willie uh, and Barry's rivalry. Yeah. Uh, then literary community, yeah, a hodgepodge there of uh, stories, uh, all one, two, three, four, five, six, what about fifteen stories there? Yeah, and you know Oxford evolved as a literary capital of the South, and it did so with the help of Willie Barry, John Grisham, Richard Ford, uh, Larry Brown, Tom Franklin, Beth Ann Finley, Curtis Wilkie. I could go on and on. Uh, the town is a living and working literary community, and the writers support each other and are a, a wonderful group, pretty rowdy at times, and uh, we have some great get gatherings with them, and uh, we have a favorite watering hole up on the square. So uh, the, uh, that section of the book is about Oxford and how it evolved, basically came out from under Faulkner's shadow with the help of square books. Right. And, and established uh, Oxford as uh, the go-to place for writers and book signings in America. It, uh, square Books was named the, the best independent bookstore in America. Yeah, it's a fabulous store. And uh, what, what an asset for Oxford, for Mississippi, and, and for, as you say, the literary capital uh, of the South. Now, Kevin and I recently recorded uh, an interview much like this uh, with um, one of Jimmy Buffett's sidekicks, Mr. Mac uh -huh. McAnally. So we got to hear a bunch of Jimmy Buffett stories, but you've got uh -huh. a Jimmy Buffett story in your book. Yeah, I've got a chapter on Jimmy because Jimmy came to a Faulkner conference in the early 80s and uh, Sims Luckett brought him. Sims Luckett was from Clarksdale and he was working as a, an assistant road manager for Jimmy at the time and he brought him over to our house and we were thrilled to have Jimmy Buffett there and um, we were having a party you know Dean and I created the Faux Faulkner contest a parody contest of William Faulkner right. and every year the winner of, who had the best parody would come and read his entry at Roanoke and so Jimmy was there for that, and we took him down to Roanoke, and the kid was up there standing on the stage, and people were uh, surrounding Jimmy to get his autograph. And uh, Barry Hanna was there, and he was wearing a T-shirt that said, Read Living Writers. <laughs> anyway, 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 that's where we first met Jimmy, and we went back to the house, and our daughters were here, Paige and Diane, in their early 20s and Jimmy started serenading them he was singing Margaritaville to them in our kitchen and I grabbed a guitar gave him a guitar and grabbed my bass because I play the upright and started playing with him that was my one moment of fame I got to back up Jimmy <laughs> jamming but, with Jimmy Buffett at Roanoke yeah yeah he loved pretty Paul. good yeah and uh, he he wrote his the first draft of his play Escape to Margaritaville and completed it at our dining room table where Faulkner finished Absalom Absalom. And Jimmy made a point of finishing it there and he signed the book to Dean and me saying, I finished this book at the same table where Faulkner finished Absalom Absalom. Wow. Uh, but uh, Jimmy uh, 
the main thing he did for Dean was he introduced her to her, his mother, Pete Buffett. Yeah. And Pete Buffett was instrumental in helping Dean adjust to life as in the shadow of a celebrity. Because Pete's also became known as the mother of Jimmy Buffett. And before Jimmy was famous, she was Pete Buffett. She didn't need to be called the mother of Jimmy. Well, Dean was felt that, that she was in Faulkner's shadow until Pete uh, gave her some advice. She said, you can't change who you are, so relax and enjoy the ride. Oh, man, that's cool. That, that could be the title of a Jimmy Buffett song, Relax. No doubt about it. <laughs> but that changed Dean's perspective on, on the struggle for identity, and she credited Pete's with changing her life. In that one simple meeting, we were at Cape Falls at the time, by the way. Jimmy had played a concert at wow. uh, at the uh, theater there on Canal Street. And uh, the Sanger? Singer, yeah, yes. Yeah. Sanger, Sanger Theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, he gave us, he gave us uh, backstage passes. And uh, we get backstage, and it's a lot of groupies who the band has invited. But Jimmy didn't invite him. Jimmy doesn't want to talk to these groupies. So he comes running out, and Dean, who is impatient, she's tired of waiting to see Jimmy, says, Jimmy Buffett, just like that. <laughs> he stopped like a, a, a dog pointing quail. He just froze, and he said, Dean, this guy will bring you to me. And then he dived into a limo <laughs> out the side door. And that's what, that's what uh, that, he, that was the night we met Pete at Cape Paul. And sadly, K. Paul's is closed. What a tragedy! No. I guess guess we no. owe, to, owe to COVID nineteen. It is. It's one of the the terrible uh, results of that this pandemic. Now, you besides publishing uh, books at the Yakbatathal Press, you also uh, edited a quarterly review or a magazine, yeah. and you and Deanie started the Ole Miss magazine, right? No, we didn't start the Ole Miss magazine. That was Willie. Willie started the that Ole Miss Willie. magazine. He was teaching journalism, and his first semester, Willie uh, wanted to publish a magazine. It, it, it was in his blood, you know. He had been editor of Harper's Magazine, and it had been a long time since he was in the saddle, so to speak. So he gets the best students in, in journalism school, and he uh, put out what I think was the best student magazine in America at the time. It was just beautiful. And I, I got to watch Willie edit their papers one night. And we had been at the uh, Holiday Inn bar where he convened class, by the way. Oh, yeah. And, and the students uh, had turned in their papers and he was getting them ready for publication. Now, this is not like a regular paper you write in class and nobody ever sees it. These were going to be published in the Ole Miss magazine. So, he is editing them as he goes. He's doing a little hands-on editing. He's touching them up, but he's very careful not to change the the, uh, the structure and the, uh, the 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 tone and the theme of it. He just is adding a little description here and there, and it was like seeing those papers come to life. I was watching over his shoulder, nursing a bourbon. Willie was drinking uh, coffee laced with bourbon. And <laughs> And I said in the book that Willie Morris could edit anywhere as long as he was upright and protected from the elements. As long as he was awake, upright, and protected from the elements, you hand him something to edit, and pow, pow, he would edit it and make it beautiful. So, uh, and, uh, so Willie, Willie had so much fun teaching at Ole Miss, and he was so well received. And he changed, he created many careers for these kids who were in his class. And they look back on him as, as, as studying under him as a pivotal moment in their lives. I know Donna Tartt was one of those that Willie yeah. influenced, and many yeah. others, John Grisham. He, he brought Donna our house one night when she was 18, and we were very impressed with her. We sat around the kitchen table and chatted, and she, was, she had this incredible quiet confidence and assurance about her. She already knew who she was, what the talent she had, and where she was going. She was just 18 years old. And Willie said, we're going to send you up there to Bennington and let you uh, get a New England education. 
and, and get the polish that you're, you're going to need. And uh, of course, her, her first novel, The Secret History, came out of that experience at Bennington. Right. Yeah, but anyway, Willie, Willie was a mentor to many writers, and I saw them uh, come through his house always late at night, telling stories, and uh, he would say, tell me about your book, or you know, tell me what your aspirations are, and he helped them very much. You know, a word of encouragement from a writer, an established writer like Willie saying, you've got it, you've got the talent, you can do it, is like the holy grail to a young writer. There's no substitute for it. We've all got to have it at some point. It doesn't matter what what uh, field you're in. You want somebody who is established in that profession to tell you that, that you're going to succeed. And I saw Willie do that on many occasions, and it meant everything to the people. And we were blessed here in Jackson uh, after Willie left Oxford. Of course, he came here, and he brought the traveling show with him. Yeah. And so, so we got to enjoy... Uh, that chapter of, of the Willie Morris show, and it was remarkable. All the people yeah, who came, well, and all yeah. the, the Jackson was very good for Willie, and Joanne Pritchard uh, was a wonderful wife for him. And I'm so glad that they got married, and and Willie, she helped Willie get established here in there in Jackson. Uh, he wrote Ghost of Mississippi, and he wrote New York Days, and My Dog Skip. And was uh, he had a wonderful 10 years there. Yes, he did. Hi, I'm Malcolm White. Thanks for listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. For access to more conversations with creative Mississippians, subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcast app. If you ever miss one of our locally produced shows or want to simply hear it again, you can find what you need at mpbonline.org or download our podcast app to your smartphone. MPB programming is on your schedule at mpbonline.org.